with uh, all of the talk of the campaign this morning, I'm reminded of a story of a rabbi who says on Yom Kippur Day to his congregation, I actually wrote three sermons for you. I have a million dollar sermon that lasts about 20 minutes. I have a $10,000 sermon that lasts about an hour. And I have a $100 sermon that lasts about two hours. We'll pass around the pledge cards now and see which one you prefer. Ezehu <laughs> Chacham, our rabbis ask, who is wise? Halomed Mikol Adam, the one who learns from every person. Every Shabbat morning, we have a wonderful security team helping to keep us safe, and one of the members of that security team, his name is Peter. And every week, Peter pulls me aside after Shabbos lunch to talk about my sermon. Yes, he's the one who's listening every week. <laughs> and one particular Shabbos, the Shabbos right before Father's Day this year, Peter pulls me aside just like he always does and discusses my sermon, and then Peter said to me, Rabbi, he says, Rabbi, tomorrow for Father's Day, I want you to ask your father a question. What in life gives you the most joy? And what in life gives you the most pain? It's a profound question. And as I began preparing myself to ask the question of, of my dad, I thought, well, that's really an amazing question. I, but I should know that answer of my father already, shouldn't I? He's my dad. Well, sure enough, that next day I had the blessing of seeing both my own father and my father-in-law. And I asked him the question, what in life gives you the most joy? And what gives you the most pain? Now, after breakfast and lunch and dinner, I was well eaten. And I had also the answers to my questions. And as we discussed it, it became pretty straightforward that what in life gives you the most joy? The birth of loved ones. There's nothing like seeing children and grandchildren being born. And what in life brings you the most pain? It's, of course, just the opposite of that. Losing a loved one, a spouse, a brother, parents. Sadly, some of us in this room have lost children as well. We say that we know our loved ones well. And if we asked our loved ones, what is it that brings you the most joy in this world and what gives you the most pain, I would imagine their answers would be pretty similar to my father's answers. But what if you take away life and death? And you say, aside from birth and aside from death, what in life gives you the most joy? Not happiness, that's something else. What in life gives you the most joy? And what causes you the most pain? I'll invite you to look around the room for a brief moment. Next to you might sit a spouse or a friend, parents or children. Do you know what gives them the most joy? Do you know what causes them the most pain? Do you know the answer to that question for yourself? joy and pain. And as I spent that Father's Day listening to my father and my father-in-law, as I spent that next week asking other people similar questions and really trying to engage in active listening and trying to hear and understand and get to know my loved ones even better by that very basic question, I was reminded of a story of Melech Shlomo, of King Solomon. Now, many of us know probably the most famous story about King Solomon. Two women come before King Solomon, the wisest king of all Israel, the man to whom we ascribe the book of Proverbs, the book of Song of Songs. And these two women came before King Solomon, and they were arguing over whose child this was. One woman said, I'm the mother of this child. And the other woman made the exact same claim. King Solomon, in his brilliance, held the baby up and said, okay, let's cut the baby in half. We'll give half to one woman and half to the other woman. Well, sure enough, one woman said, ah, that's a brilliant compromise. Go ahead and do it. 
The other woman said, no, no, no. Give that child to the other woman, so long as you just let that child live. King Solomon said, aha, now I know who the mother of this child is, the one who was willing to risk losing the child, so long as he could stay alive. That's the child's mother. And we know of King Solomon this incredible wisdom. We know of him as a grown man writing these incredible proverbs, writing that biblical love story that is Song of Songs. But we may not know of King Solomon as a young child. And in the book of Malachim, in the book of 1 Kings, the Bible talks of a King Solomon as a young 12-year-old boy who's just inherited the throne from his father, the great King David. Now there stood King Solomon in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in the king's palace. And he could have asked anything of his father. He could have asked anything of God. And so sure enough, King Solomon turns to God. And what does King Solomon ask for? A leb shomea, a listening heart. This 12-year-old boy, that's what he asked of God. He could have anything he wanted, including the greatest new Lego set. But he asked for a Lev Shomei, a listening heart. God was so excited by King Solomon's request, this 12-year-old boy, that he says to King Solomon, you could have asked me for riches and glory. You could have asked me to have the whole world presented to you. But instead, you ask for a Lev Shomei, a listening heart. I will grant your request, God says. Now, this idea of a listening heart is at the center of what it means to be a Jew. Do you know the book of Deuteronomy says the word listen 92 times? We're supposed to listen to God. And of course, we know the most famous of those lines, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Ninety-two times we're commanded in that one book alone to listen to our Creator. And frankly, we spend most of today beating our chest and sitting and standing and standing and standing and standing and standing because of our failure to listen. Our failure to listen to God, to fulfill the mitzvot, God has given us a prescription for a meaningful life, for a beautiful life of gratitude, of obligation and joy. And we repent today because we fail to listen to what God asks of us. How many times does the book of Deuteronomy tell us to listen? 92 times. You can count it later if you don't believe me. But our tradition tells us not just to listen to God, but to listen to the voice of those who are in need. The former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, he tells the story that the Queen of England, you know the Queen, she's known for being very structured, very formal. Her schedule runs the same way. She is prompt as prompt can be. Rabbi Sachs tells a story one time of accompanying the queen to Auschwitz. And there at, the Aus at Auschwitz, the queen hosted a number of Holocaust survivors. And the queen invited each one of those survivors to come forward and to share their story. And wouldn't you know, the queen stayed two hours later than she had intended to because she, the queen, understood the power and the importance of listening. Rabbi Sachs tells another story. He tells the story of Viktor Frankl, the famous Holocaust survivor who went on to become a renowned therapist. And Viktor Frankl tells a story that one night he got a, a phone call from a woman who was contemplating suicide. And Viktor Frankl stayed on the phone with that woman not 10 minutes, not 20 minutes, but two hours. And sure enough, after two hours, they hung up the phone. Viktor Frankl was confident that this woman was going to be okay. Well, a couple of years go by, and Viktor Frankl encounters this woman. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about you and wondering, 
Over the course of that two-hour conversation, I said everything I could think of to try to keep you from killing yourself, to try to keep you alive. What was it? What was the one thing I said that changed your mind and encouraged you to stay alive? The woman laughed and responded to Victor Frankl and said, it wasn't one thing that you said to me. It was the realization that you would give me two hours of your time just to listen. If you were willing to give me two hours of your time, I knew that I must be worth something. Jewish tradition teaches that not only do we have an obligation to listen, but it is a mitzvah, it is an obliga uh, obligation, a sacred commandment from God himself to act upon what we hear. And so it is, we'll know whether or not this entire day of Yom Kippur has been successful if tonight and tomorrow you begin to change your life. Are you listening? Are you paying attention? How many times does the book of Deuteronomy tell us to listen? All right, they're listening, Rabbi, they're listening. And so we are together now at this Yisker hour. And I was reflecting on this idea of listening. We listen to God, or we don't listen to God. We listen to those who are in need, and we repent because we don't listen enough to those who are in need. But as we join together now at this Yisker hour, we're reminded that it's not just God and those in need to whom we need to listen. It's those we love. We need to listen better to those we love. Our friends, our family, and especially at this Yisker hour. We're reminded that we need to do a better job of listening to those who came before. If you had an opportunity right now, what do you think those whom you remember at this Yisker hour, parents or grandparents, spouses, friends, if you could ask them what gives them, what gave them the most joy or what gave them the most pain, how do you think they would answer? Do you know? Are you living your life in such a way to honor their legacy by creating that kind of joy in others, preventing that kind of pain? from afflicting others. We also repent at this Yisker hour of Yom Kippur because we haven't done enough to perpetuate the Jewish people. After all, many of us, frankly, choose college football over Shabbos lunch. We choose to pursue happiness rather than joy. We might choose to run errands on a Friday night rather than make a beautiful Shabbat dinner. Our people are suffering today because of choices that we make. We, we're sitting here in shul and still our people suffer because of the choices we make. Because our friends and our family, our children and our grandchildren, liberal Jews are not having enough kids and because we're assimilating far too quickly. We repent, and we must repent for these sins against our ancestors as well, for not taking our Judaism seriously enough. We sin and we repent for not taking Jewish law and Jewish tradition seriously enough. But at this Yisker hour, as we think about the chain of tradition that goes all the way back to Avram Avinu and Sarah Imenu to Abraham and Sarah, we're also challenged to think about the generations yet to come. Children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren yet unborn. And just as we repent at this Yisker hour for not doing enough to honor our parents and our grandparents and the generations that came before, I'll ask you, are we doing enough now for our children, for our grandchildren, for our great-grandchildren? Are we allowing Jewish tradition to change so that they too can find a place among the Jewish people? 
Are we doing a good enough job of welcoming gays and lesbians into our community? Are we doing a good enough job of welcoming the interfaith into our community? Are we doing a good enough job of practicing what we preached to them about fairness and justice and equality and caring for those who are in need? Are we doing enough to strengthen the state of Israel, but also to make sure that it is the Reshit Smichat Gulatenu, the beginning of the flowering of redemption that we want it to be? We stand here today very much at the intersection of tradition and modernity. And we ought to repent for falling too far into one side or into the other. We ought to repent for being either too rigid in our commitment to tradition or being too flexible in chasing after that which is easy, that which is the less challenging route. At this Yisker hour, as we seek to honor the legacy of those who came before and those who come after, may we truly open our ears to listen to what they need, to what they want. May God bless us with the wisdom to know which is best. I'm reminded of the story of a woman who brought a very precious Bible to the post office. She was going to ma mail it to her children who lived out of state. And as she brought the Bible to the post office, the person behind the counter said, ma'am, is there anything in this box that's breakable? The woman responded, only the commandments. <laughs> At this Yisker hour, let us contemplate what that means for those who came before. Let us ask what we have to do to sustain Judaism for those who come after us. What would bring you the most joy? What causes you the most pain? And how would that question be answered for the loved ones sitting around you? And perhaps even more importantly right now for those who came before and those who will come after. Now, I told you that King Solomon, when he was a 12-year-old boy, asked for a lev shomea, a listening heart. God rewarded him for his request. But not only did God give Solomon a lev shomea, a listening heart, he gave to Solomon a lev chacham v'navon, a wise and understanding heart. On this Yom Kippur and at this Yisker hour, May we have the courage and strength to ask those we love what gives them the most joy and what gives them the most pain. May we have the wisdom to try to discern what our ancestors might have answered of the same questions. May we have the vision to know what will be best for our children and for those who came after it. At this Yisker hour, may God grant to each of us a lev shamea, a listening heart, as well as a lev chacham v'navon, a truly wise and discerning being. And may God bless us all with peace. Gemar chatima tova, may we each be sealed for a good, a righteous, and a listening new year. Amen.